Good morning. Welcome to worship. It's great to be back with you today after taking a sabbatical for two weeks with COVID. Um, I don't wish that upon anybody. Um, still have some of the lingering effects. They say I'm clear of it all, but I still have those long-term effects. If any of you have had COVID, you know of some of that. You just don't feel good, number one. You're tired all the time. Runny nose, the congestion, the cough, the aches and pains, they said can be there for a while. And it's like, I'm tired of it now after two weeks. But they say hopefully after a while it goes all away. But um, yeah, so I'm here. I'm glad to be here with you. Um, I'll greet you in the back when service is done. I won't shake hands. I'll continue to kind of distance from you. Communion will have today. I will consecrate the elements. Um, the elders will be distributing it. We'll do continuous line as we've done in the past. One will be doing bread. One will be doing um, the wine. And then they'll switch. We'll do all of the east side first and then the west side again. And then I'll kind of keep my distance from you. Um, so nobody has to worry about it. But they say I'm not supposed to be contagious anymore, although I don't understand their rules. I've read through all of that stuff, and it's so confusing. But I'm here. It's good to be back. Um, and welcome to worship. We follow our order of worship that's been printed out for us. Um, it's also up on the overhead. We begin with our opening hymn, God Himself is Present. We stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. <clears throat> we justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, 
and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of the word, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join in singing our Kyrie and Gloria. Let us pray together. Almighty God, you know we live in the midst of so many dangers that in our frailty we cannot stand upright. Grant strength and protection to support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our Old Testament reading for today comes from the book of Jeremiah, the first chapter. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a youth, for to all to whom I send you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put his hand, put out his hand, and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth, See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson comes from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12. I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. 
If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord. We now stand and speak our Alleluia and verse together. Alleluia. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Alleluia. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the fourth chapter. Jesus went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath, and they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! Ah, what do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. And he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appear, appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had, had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came after him, and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We join in singing our creedal hymn.
Please be seated. We join in singing our next hymn, Son of God, Eternal Savior. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for our meditation today comes from our Old Testament lesson from Jeremiah. It was read a few moments ago from the lectern, dear friends in Christ. Reluctant. Reluctant to talk. Reluctant to talk about Jesus Christ. Lutherans are reluctant. You are reluctant. I am reluctant. We are by nature and by culture and by denominational heritage reluctant to talk with others about Jesus Christ. A number of years ago there was a sociological study done of Lutherans. It concluded that 90% of Lutherans rarely or never spoke to anybody about their faith in Jesus Christ. In this study, active Lutheran Christians who attended church three out of the four times every month, it was found that 40% of these Lutherans never talked to anyone about Jesus Christ. 35% of them rarely spoke about Christ. 13% of them spoke about Christ to their kids about once a month. And 12% spoke among their family about Christ maybe once a week. Only 12% of active Lutheran church members spoke to their family about Christ on a weekly basis. What a devastating commentary that is on the Lutheran church. This sociological study concluded then that Lutherans 
are reluctant to talk about Christ, even with their children, not to mention being reluctant to speak to others about Jesus Christ. It is with this mood of reluctance, then, that we approach today's Old Testament lesson. Jeremiah, he was a young guy, a teenager, a young man, if you will. He was a reluctant mouthpiece of God who didn't want to talk to other people about God. In other words, Jeremiah was a good Lutheran. He was reluctant to talk about God. Our text begins after Jeremiah tells us just a little bit about himself in the first three verses of chapter 1. And then we have our text that we heard a little bit ago. It was Jeremiah's call to the prophetic ministry. God told Jeremiah that he was going to be his prophet. And guess what? Jeremiah had all sorts of excuses. Jeremiah pleads. He's too unworthy for the task that God is asking him to fulfill. He doesn't know how to speak. I'm too young. Generally, it meant back in these days the word that he hadn't yet taken responsibility for a profession. So he's a teenager, a young man, and it's probably better translated to use the word boy or young man in our text. Jeremiah, he professed he just didn't have the maturity necessary to take his place among the, the elders and to speak. He wasn't valued for his wisdom or experience because he was so young. He felt he was just far too young and inexperienced to do what God was calling him to do and asking him to do. Yet, God called Jeremiah anyways and equips him for the task set before him to be his spokesperson. There are many other prophets in the Old Testament who were reluctant to speak about their faith in God. Jeremiah wasn't the only one. God said to Isaiah, he said, Isaiah, I want you to be my prophet. I want you to be my talker, and I want you to talk of your faith in me. And Isaiah replies to God, and he says, oh no, God, I can't do that. No, nope, I can't be your talker, because you see, God, I'm a person of unclean lips. You should hear some of the things that I say. Gideon responded to God, not me, Lord. I quote, I come from the weakest of the tribes. I come from the weakest of the backgrounds. I have just a really poor education. Moses, he too found excuses and he said, I have a speech impediment, God. I can't. I got this problem speaking and I have a stutter. I'm not good at talking at all. I can't be your prophet. And God would not take no from any of them. And with godly persuasion then, God equipped each and every one of them to be his spokesman for him. You know, we Americans love choice. Choice is a big word. We want to have things the way we want them. Advertising slogans often entice us uh, with illusions of choices everywhere. And maybe some of you remember a years back, but I just saw it the other day on a commercial from them from Burger King. The old slogan was, have it your way. It's your choice how you want your burger made. So have it your way. Go into any store, and I don't care what store it is, to buy nearly any pro product in the store, and you face a mind-boggling array of choices. So many choices. Our society has even disguised the violence of abortion under the sweet-sounding label of choice. God isn't so much about choice, and he isn't so much into choice. He knows that we don't have the power to choose salvation, so he doesn't offer a choice whatsoever. Instead, he does the work. He chooses us. He reaches down and chooses us. And when God decides that we are to serve him... He settles the issue. It's not a choice. We may have our uncertainties about what he's asking us to do and insecurities, just as Jeremiah did in our text. But God brushes those things aside. He pushes them aside and he assigns us our work and tells us how it is to be. As it was with Jeremiah, so it is with us as well. There are no two ways about it. When God has spoken, that is that. It is not a choice. God calls us. He calls us to be his spokespeople. Yet we also are reluctant. 
We are reluctant prophets, reluctant spokesmen and women for God. We too are filled with inhibitions, excuses, and reasons why we can't do the job. God not only calls us, calls you and me, he equips us then his children to do the tasks that he has set before each and every one of us. Jeremiah was frightened by God, by what God asked of him, and yet he had to do it. But he did not do it without a promise, though. Jeremiah wrote God's comfort to him in our text. He says, do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. You and I also have a promise. Just as our call is not the same sort of direct call that Jeremiah received, we and we are not given to be prophets like Jeremiah to the world leaders and to speak prophetic utterances as he was. Our promise is not necessarily for the protection then from the assaults of the world that are going on out there or the troubles of the world. Our promise is different. Our promise is the gospel. Our promise is that whatever the world may serve up to each and every one of us, we have eternal life and we will know joy and peace and life beyond death and we will be free from sickness and, and sorrow and all troubles. Not every moment we live on this earth is going to be a delight, Scripture tells us. That's not promised anywhere in Scripture. We're just called to be God's spokespeople. We too will need to face the trials and the tribulations in this life, and then face death one day. That's part of the deal. But our promise is that because of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven, and come what may on this earth, we have everlasting life and glory and peace and joy set before us because of what Jesus Christ has done for us and given to us. That's called the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Jeremiah wrote, he said, then the Lord stretched, stretched out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. That was the great and terrible work that was assigned to Jeremiah. He had God's work to do, God's word to speak, and it was going to shake the world uh, up, the, the world that he knew it was just going to devastate it. You and I don't have that same charge, but we do have God's work to do, and we do have God's word to speak. Our part in telling and the shaking is not quite the same as what Jeremiah had to do, but it is something God has set before us and taught us in his word and given us his spirit to, to both believe his promises and then to do what he has asked us to do. God touches us, and miraculously, God uses people like us, like you and me. He uses people as common as we are to speak to silently talk with our hands, to silently talk with our feet as we go the extra mile. God uses us to do his speaking. God always uses common and ordinary people to do his work. Like God did to Jeremiah, he chooses each and every one of you. He touches your courage, your spirit in your mouth and puts words into your mouth and you too become a prophet, if you will, a mouthpiece for the Lord God. This is what happened to Jeremiah. This is what happens to you and me. God's no respecter of persons of any age or any class, gender, or race when it comes to the call to serve him and his purposes. In answer to Jeremiah's protests and everyone else's protests out there, and in resisting God's call, God God has an answer for each and every one of us and each and every person out there that goes something like this. I am calling you to do this because I, I need you. It needs to be done. And with my help, you'll be able to do it. I'll provide you with everything that you need in order to do it. Listen to me and trust me. And I will be with you every step of the way, no matter what. No matter how inadequate you feel out there, God has a marvelous way of using each and every one of you. When you hesitate and you wonder, what can I possibly say or do? Remember Jeremiah who said, Ah, sovereign Lord, I do not know how to speak. I'm only a child. And remember the words of God then who reassured Jeremiah with the words, Do not be afraid, I will be with you. 
When a task is very simple, do you know what we often say? We often say, even a child can do it. God calls us, his children, to work for him, and sometimes he asks us to do some impossibly difficult things, like sharing the good news about Jesus in our day-to-day lives, like serving others, like helping others in whatever way, shape, or form it might be. You are a child of God by grace through faith, just like Jeremiah. Perhaps you think you have too hard of an assignment. And when you get those assignments and you wonder, what can I possibly say or do? Remember Jeremiah. Oh, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But then remember those great words from God himself who reassured Jeremiah and us saying, do not be afraid of them, for I am with you. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which goes beyond all human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in true faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. We stand for prayer. Gracious Creator God, your Son commanded demons and they obeyed him, so that afflicted people were set free. Cast out the forces of darkness, both open and hidden, in our world. Give courage, faith, peace, and relief to our brotherhood throughout all the world who suffer for the sake of Jesus Christ, and hold your children in your care. Lord, in your mercy. Holy One, your Son taught with authority. Through those called into holy ministry, use that authority to forgive sin, strengthen faith, and empower lives of good works, that people of this world would see your love in us. Lord, in your mercy. Forgive our sins, Lord, especially the false acts that cannot pass for real love. Enable us to reflect your love, which is patient and kind, does not envy or boast, is not arrogant or rude, and does not insist on its own way. Fill our lives with good works that truly care for others. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you know all things, and the words of your mouth stand over nations and over kingdoms, able to pluck up and to break down, destroy and overthrow. Rule by your might that our nation may be governed and preserved. Do not let us be dismayed as citizens in this world or of your kingdom, for you are king above all. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord God, forget not the afflicted, but hear their desires and strengthen their hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we know that you hold all things in your hand, and we ask that you would, in your mercy, provide for the needs of those who were affected by the tragic house fire in Pierce this past week. We ask, Lord, that you continue to be with all those who are affected by it, be with the family and the loss of loved ones who died. Be also with those first responders who were involved, Lord, as they knew many of those people know each other. We ask, Lord, your blessings upon them and that we ask that you would bring relief and care to those devastated lives, broken hearts, and injured. We ask you to draw all to the cross of Christ, who is our salvation now and always. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we praise you for all who have lived and died with faith in Christ and now rest in your presence. Unite us with your Son and with those saints as we eat and drink his life-giving body and blood at this altar, in, with, and under the bread and wine. Grant us repentant hearts as we receive your gifts and strengthen us to care for the needs of others in the way of Christ our Savior. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, your Son has come with favor to deliver us, and in his blessed sacrament he brings cleansing and strength. Give faith to all that we would not despise our Savior and this Holy Communion. Do not pass through us and go away as at Nazareth, but dwell among us graciously forever. Lord, in your mercy. 
into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. I exhort you in Christ that you give attention to the testament of Christ in true faith and above all take to heart the words with which Christ presents his body and blood to us for forgiveness that you take note of and give thanks for the boundless love that he showed us when he saved us from the wrath of God sin death and hell by his blood and that you then externally receive the bread and wine that is his body and blood as a guarantee and pledge let us then in his name according to his command and his own words administer and receive the testament. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which was shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We join in singing the Sanctus. peace of the Lord be with you always. We join in singing the Agnes Day.
We stand. And now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, may it strengthen and preserve you in true faith until life everlasting. Go in the peace of the Lord. Amen. We join in singing our post-communion hymn. We pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming we may together with all your saints celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Please be seated as we sing our closing hymn. Again, good morning to all of you. It's great to have you here as you go about your walk with the Lord this week. Remember that God has called each and every one of you to do his work in his kingdom. And no matter how inadequate you might feel, he equips you to do whatever that work might be that he calls you to do. 
You do not have the same work as Jeremiah did to call and destroy and to tear down and to build up, but you do have the call to go out and serve Jesus in his kingdom and for him. So as you go about that walk and you remember that, remember God equips you to take care of that and do it. Have a great rest of the week with the Lord. I'll see you in the back. I'll be standing behind the offering box. I'm not shaking anybody's hand, um, but I'll be back there and greet you. Have a great rest of the week with the Lord. Thank <laughs> you.